go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended um, this series before, this is a, a colloquium series in theoretical computer science that we started uh, last year in honor of our dear late colleague, Rajiv Madhwani. And uh, this quarter, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for the quarter, Salil Vedan, uh, from Harvard University, where he's a, a full professor, chair professor. Uh, we're lucky enough to have him out here in the Bay Area this year. He's uh, on sabbatical, spending time both uh, here at Stanford and also at uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, so Salil's been a leader in computational complexity and uh, pseudo-randomness, randomness computation, uh, pretty much ever since he was a, a PhD student uh, at MIT. He won the ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award uh, back in 2000. He also won the Girdle Prize, which is basically the, the main test of time award in zero computer science uh, in 2009 for his work on expanders. And today, he'll be talking about uh, computational entropy. Thanks, Tim, for the generous introduction. Um, and it's a, it's a real honor to be speaking here in this, in this uh, series in memory of Rajiv Mutwani. Um, and it's been wonderful to be here at Stanford uh, this year, um, having lots of great interactions. And I look forward to interacting with, uh, with many of you in the five months that are left. The time is going by too quickly. Um, so I'll be talking about computational entropy, uh, joint work with um, Iftak Haitner, Thomas Hollenstein, Omer Reingold, Hotek Wee, and Colin Jang. I'll be mentioning a few different papers involving different subsets of these authors. The main thing I'll be focusing on, uh, though, is should joint work with uh, Colin Jang, who is sitting over there. And we'll be giving a theory lunch talk next week on uh, some things related to this work that I won't be able to talk about today. Okay, so the context um, for uh, this work, or the, the motivation for it, comes from the foundations of uh, cryptography. So to put this uh, uh, into context, and the interaction between the foundations of cryptography and information theory, um, uh, recall so the, the sort of the, the the history here. So in the in the seminal work of Shannon in the 40s, he um, gave the sort of first ri mathematically rigorous treatment of cryptography, um, uh, saying what one might mean by security and cryptography, what one wants to achieve, but mostly came to negative conclusions, saying that in, sort of stand in the sort of standard settings that one might think about on a standard in insecure communication channel, um, uh, cryptography is basically impractical, impractical. If you have two people who want to communicate securely, uh, in information theoretic sense, um, the total amount of key they need to share has to be at least as long as all the data they ever want to communicate with each other. Okay, so um, basically this is a, a, a negative conclusion and uh, hinted already in Shannon's paper or, or potential ways of, of getting around it and cer certainly there were some ideas in, the, in other people's minds around, around the same time uh, if people who saw the uh, recent letter of uh, recently found letter of John Nash to the NSA. Um, to get around this, the, the idea was to try and base cryptography, not, not try and design systems that are impossible to break, but instead design ones that are computationally infeasible to break. Okay, and so even though this idea was around earlier, it really didn't take off until uh, the work of Diffie and Hellman in the mid 70s who suggested to really, and, and gave a serious uh, start to basing cryptography on the emerging field of, co field of computational complexity. And so here the idea again is to assume your adversary has limited computational resources, a lot of computational resources, but, but some, some reasonable bound on it. And the second idea is to base cryptography on problems that are be believed to be computationally hard. And so try and design your crypto system so that breaking it involves solving some problem that we, we uh, believe to be computationally hard and computational complexity was starting to generate examples of such problems. And in addition to starting to put cryptography, turn cryptography from an art into a science, this also enabled thinking about things in cryptography that people hadn't even conceived of before, like public key cryptography, digital signatures, and, and many other things. Okay, so what is the most basic kind of computationally hard problem uh, we can base cryptography on. Um, what was suggested by Diffie and Hellman was the concept of a one-way function. And that's a function that's easy to compute in the forward direction, but hard to invert. So um, 
Uh, and so uh, a candid example is the multiplication function, right? So multiplying two numbers is easy using the great, you know, grade school algorithm. You can multiply you know, very large numbers uh, very quickly, but inverting this function is the problem of integer factorization, um, which for which we don't know any fast algorithms and whose complexity seems to grow very quickly as the size of the numbers gets bigger. Okay, so formally, uh, one-way function is a function, um, say from bit strings to bit strings of, of, of n bits going to n bits uh, for simplicity. Think of n as a, as a growing parameter, so we really have a function for every length n, but it'll be used to pin down a particular length that we're interested in. We're interested in asymptotics as n goes to infinity. f should be computable in polynomial time, some fixed power of n, and that's the easiness of computing f. And the hardest of inversion is in the following strong average case sense. So um, if I pick an input, an n-bit input uh, uniformly at random, evaluate the function. Um, so if I and now run any feasible algorithm, say polynomial time, algorithm runs in some polynomial time in n, uh, the probability that it inverts the function should, should be going to zero very quickly and faster than one over any polynomial in n. Okay, and inverting the function, I want to stress here, um, means finding any pre-image of the point f of x. Uh, we aren't going to assume, it's important for the results I'm, I'll be talking about to be interesting, we aren't going to assume the function is, is one to one, except when I say so in the talk. Okay, so this is a very, um, that there exist one-way functions is a very, it's a very simply stated assumption, and it's a it's a very plausible one. We can't we can't pr hope to, or we don't know how to prove it. Proving it would proving that one-way functions exist would, in particular, in, uh, uh, involve re resolving the p versus n p problem. But one-way functions um, seem to be e everywhere. So I mean, this factorization is just one one example. But it seems that if you throw to throw together enough um, uh, uh, simple but random-like operations, um, you, it, it's almost hard not to construct a one-way function, okay? Because all you need to do is create a process that's, you know, easy to, to, to carry forward but hard, hard to reverse. Okay, so this is a very simple and plausible assumption, but surprisingly, a huge amount of cryptography can be based on this very simple assumption that one-way functions exist, okay? And so, um, from the, assuming the existence of one-way functions exist, you can, you can build all kinds of sort of basic but qualitative uh, cryptographic primitives, pseudo-random generators that I'll talk about in some depth, certain kinds of uh, uh, collision-resistant hash functions, things called uh, commitment schemes, pseudo-random functions, and then with these, this is all through a series of works in the, in the mid to late 80s, um, do solve a lot of interesting, from the application's point of view, um, uh, cryptographic problems. You can basically solve every problem of private key cryptography, construct amazing things called zero-knowledge proofs, where I can prove something to you um, with you learning nothing else other than the fact that what I'm proving is true. Um, even construct public key sorts of uh, objects like digital signatures and, and build secure protocols for very complicated tasks. So basically any efficiently computable function, n parties can, a number of parties can get together and compute a joint function, securely compute a joint function of their inputs such that as long as the majority of them are honest and following the protocol, no one will learn anything about anyone else's input except what's implied by the output of the function. Okay, really amazing things you can do, all just assuming that there exists a one-way function. Okay. It's important to remark there are some things that are not on this picture. So there is, there is a fair amount of cryptography that we don't know how to do. And actually there's good evidence that we can't do from one-way functions. Public key encryption is, is one example and there are a number of, number of, number of other uh, examples as well. But it is quite surprising how much you can do from one-way functions. Okay, so the work I want to be <coughs> talking about is motivating really, motivated by trying to understand how is this possible? How, how can we, why, you know, really understanding why, why uh, we can do this. Okay, so, um, um, you know, uh, so we're really interested in understanding this first layer here. 
of how we turn this sort of raw hardness of a one-way function that's present in a one-way function, which may be very unstructured, and turn it into this first level of uh, basic cryptographic primitives that give you very sort of qualitative guarantees and one, so this is really the hardest part in some sense in this picture is this going from one-way functions to the first level of, of cryptographic primitives here. All right, so you sort of take this unstructured hardness of a one-way function and turn it into something more structured from which you can do much more qualitative reasoning to build more sophisticated cryptographic protocols. Okay, so that's the question we're interested in and the answer that I that seems to be emerging um, and that I want to give you a sense of in the talk is uh, involves computational entropy. And the answer is understanding that every cryptographic primitive, its security guarantees can be understood in terms of some form, some notion of computational entropy. Okay, and I'll say what I mean by computational entropy in, uh, uh, shortly. Um, and second, to uh, be able to show that already directly in a one-way function we can see that there is some small amount of this computational entropy already present directly from the one-wayness property of the one-way function. And so constructing complicated cryptographic primitives from one-way functions involves um, manipulating, finding ways to amplify and manipulate this little bit of computational entropy that's already present in a one-way function. Okay, so before talking about computational entropy, I should review what is entropy itself. Um, so uh, Shannon's notion of uh, the entropy in a discrete random variable x is um, given by the formula above here. You, you take a random sample from x and take the expectation of log of 1 over the probability mass of that sample. Okay, we won't need, we won't be saying anything that really involves in, the, in this talk, uh, in, uh, getting into the details of this formula, should think of the entropy of x, h of x, as measuring the amount of uh, the number of bits of randomness in the random variable x on average. Okay, so if I toss n coins together, they'll have n bits of randomness intuitively, and indeed the entropy of uh, n coin tosses is n. Okay. So one thing that is useful to know is the entropy is, is between zero and log of the support size, the number of elements with non-zero probability under the, under the random variable. With equality here, so uh, the entropy is zero if and only if the random variable puts all its mass on a single point, and it's log of the support if and only if the random variable is uniform on its support. Okay. Uh, and all logs in the talk are base two. And uh, this also will also refer to conditional entropy, Shannon's notion of conditional entropy. If I have two jointly distributed random variables, x and y, the entropy of x given y is the average over samples from y of the entropy of x conditioned on that sample of y. Okay, and I'll briefly at times mention there's some kind of more worst case analogs of, of entropy. Shannon entropy, I said you can think of as measuring the amount of randomness in X on average. Uh, there are these worst case notions, uh, min entropy, which replaces the expectation with a minimum, and max entropy, which is a, just that upper bound on the entropy that I mentioned earlier, uh, log of the size of support. And uh, the Shannon entropy is sandwiched between the, the min entropy and the max entropy. Okay, so, all right, so now what do we mean by computational entropy? Um, the basic idea, and there, as we'll see in the talk, there are, there are a number of different notions of computational entropy, okay, and, and, and part of the, the, the work here is to try and understand the relationships between these different notions of computational entropy. But generally, um, we're using the term computational entropy to mean that an algorithm with bounded computational resources, for example, a polynomial time algorithm, may perceive the entropy in a random variable to be very different than its Shannon entropy. Okay, and perceive is in quotes because again we have different notions of computational entropy. Um, so the first kind of uh, simplest example of this is a random variable x that's the output of a pseudorandom generator. And for those who haven't seen what a pseudorandom generator is, I'll just quickly uh, 
review it. Uh, it's a beautiful concept uh, from Blum, Macaulay, and Yao in uh, 20 years ago, 1982. And I was, as I was preparing this talk, I was amazed at how many of my citations were from, of the fundamental things were from 1982. Uh, what? 30 years ago. Oh, I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, 30 years ago. Um, then it was just an amazing year for um, theoretical computer science, um, and in particular these, these areas. Okay, so uh, what is a pseudorandom generator? So it's, a, it's an efficiently computable, say polynomial time computable function that stretches some, uh, a short, truly random seed, say m bits, to a longer string um, that can't be truly random because you're generating many bits out of, out, of, out of a small number of random bits and deterministically, but that should be pseudo-random, should look random in some sense. Okay, and what does pseudo-random mean? Right, it, says, it means that the output of the pseudo-random generator, when I evaluate it on a, so UM is a uniformly random m-bit string, on a uniformly random seed, should be what's called computationally indistinguishable from a uniformly random n-bit string. Okay, what does computationally indistinguishable mean? Um, it means that no feasible, say, polynomial time statistical test should be able to tell them apart. Okay, that is for every polynomial time algorithm, if you give it a sample of, so here, I say I have any polynomial time algorithm T, you give it a random output of the pseudorandom generator that is evaluated on a truly random seed, or I give it in truly random bits, the probability that it accepts, all right, it says outputs one, for example, should be approximately the same in both cases. Okay? And the, the, really, the thing that's really powerful about this is that we're not saying anything, we're not writing down a fixed finite list of tests that we want to try, which is a sort of traditional approach to pseudorandomness. We're requiring this for any feasible, computationally feasible test, for every computationally feasible test, even ones that that take much more time to compute than, than the running time of the pseudorandom generator. Okay, so intuitively, the output of the pseudorandom generator on a truly random seed is as good as truly random bits for any computationally feasible purpose. Okay, so this is a very um, strong uh, definition of pseudorandomness. The question is whether it's achievable and um, the answer seems to be yes, um, but, uh, but like I said before, we can't prove it unconditionally because it would re involve resolving the p versus np question. Um, so, but just to make things concrete, this is all very abstract. Here's a, here's a concrete example, the Blum Blum Shub generator. Um, its seed is a, uh, uh, a random composite number, say, obtained by choosing two large random primes and multiplying them with each other. Actually, they should be congruent to three mod four, but uh, uh, not worry about that detail. Um, and a random element modulo n, relatively prime to n. And all you do is you take x and you take its least significant bit, whether it's even or odd, as, as an integer. And then you square it modulo n, take the least significant bit, and you square it again take the least significant bit, and you keep doing this, and just produce a sequence, a long sequence of bits, as many as, many as you want. Okay. Um, and this is known to be a pseudorandom generator if factoring, probably if and only if, it, yeah, uh, factoring uh, integers is hard. Um, this is the results of uh, Alexei Chor, Goldreich, and Schnorr also, these papers are also from 1982. Okay, so this is, this is great, a very simple construction. And what's amazing, you prove, can prove that if, if you can tell these bits apart by any efficient test from truly random bits, then you can use it to factor large integers. Okay. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we're, the kind of result that we're interested in, but we don't want to just assume that factoring integers is hard, as I said earlier. We want to be able to just assume that we have a one-way function. All right, so if factoring integers turns out to be easy, we can replace it with some other one-way, conjectured one-way function. Okay, so we can't exploit, like this generator does, the number theoretic structure in a function like the, the factoring function. Okay, so 
Um, pseudo-random generators, um, this definition came out of considerations of what you, you want from a pseudo-random generator in cryptography, but they've turned out to have impact in lots of other areas of theoretical computer science, understanding the power of uh, the complexity theoretic power of randomized algorithms versus deterministic algorithms, understanding what problems are hard, hard in, in, in machine, for machine learning, understanding why proving circuit lower bounds is hard, um, and this is, for, for me, much of the reason for studying these, these problems in the foundations of cryptography is that they, they seem to provide insight into lots of other things that we're interested in in, in theoretical computer science. Okay, so now back to computational entropy. All right, so why is a pseudo-random generator giving us some kind of computational entropy? Consider the output of the generator on a, ran, on a random seed. By definition, this is supposed to be, you can't, indistinguishable, you can't tell it apart from n random bits from, okay, so it's indistinguishable from having entropy n, but it's Shannon entropy in the information theoretic sense is at most m because it's generated by applying a function to m bit strings. Okay, so in particular its support size is at most 2 to the m. Okay, so this is a kind of the first sense and a qualitative one. Here we're really talking about the extreme of entropy. When you're n random bits, you don't need the general quantitative, and, and your support size is small, you don't need the general quantitative definition of, of entropy. Um, but it turns out to be useful to have a more general quantitative formulation. And this was given by Hostad and Pagliazzo, Levin and Luby. And they give this more general definition that a random variable x, we say it has pseudo-entropy k, or it, at least k, if there exists a random variable y that's indistinguishable from x in the same sense as before, no polynomial time algorithm can tell them apart except with small probability, and the entropy of y is bigger than or equal to k. All right, so your pseudo-entropy is k if you're indistinguishable from something with entropy k. Okay. And uh, for technical reason, for re reasons that I won't get into in the talk, this definition turns out to only be interesting really as a lower bound on pseudoentropy. That's why I say the pseudoentropy is at least k. Um, it doesn't make sense somehow you end up with an uninteresting notion if you talk about being indistinguishable from distributions of random variables of low entropy. In fact, every random, turns out that every random variable is indistinguishable from something of very low entropy. And don't worry about why, why that's true. Um, Okay, so this definition is interesting when k is bigger than the entropy of x. Okay, so we have a gap. The pseudo-entropy is larger than the actual Shannon entropy in the random variable x. Okay, so this is a very nice definition, but what is it good for? Well, um, it turns out to be used in the seminal result of uh, Hostad et al. showing that from any one-way function you can construct a pseudo-random generator. Okay, and a very high level and, and, and very oversimplified uh, picture for, for how their proof of this result goes is from a one-way function, they show how to construct uh, an efficiently sampleable random variable x, meaning one where you can efficiently generate samples from it, where the pseudo-entropy is slightly larger than its Shannon entropy. Okay. Noticeably, but, but just by a small amount. And then by replacing x with many independent samples of x, concatenating many independent samples of x together, this entropy on average turn these entropies on average that we when we're talking about Shannon entropy and pseudo indistinguishability from Shannon entropy turn into the worst case notions that I mentioned earlier. So x ends up being indistinguishable from having high min entropy, and uh, even if you compare it to essentially the support size of the, random variable, the new random variable. And moreover, the gap in entropies goes from being small to very large as you take many copies. And then, it, then by some uh, application of hashing, universal hashing, you can turn this having pseudo min entropy into pseudo randomness that you want in the output of a pseudo random generator and having small support intuitively into having a small seed for your pseudo-random generator. 
Okay, so this is, a, this is kind of the intuition between the hostile et al. result. Um, there turn out to be a number of technical complications that come up there that, that make the constru construction more involved in ad hoc and, than, than this picture indicates. But now, in using the kind of the results that I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about, we actually have a construction that fits this, this, uh, this explanation much you know, more directly. Okay, so what I want to now talk about is give some intuition for this first part here, and that's really where I'll focus my attention. How is it from a one-way function, where we just have this prob pro property of being hard to invert, we can get this entropy versus pseudo-entropy kind of gap? Um, okay, so for now, if, let's restrict our attention to one-to-one one-way functions. It simplifies, simplifies things. And later I'll mention about um, generalizing, not assuming the function is one injective. Okay, so we have one-to-one one one-way one -one function. Consider a uniformly random input. Okay, since the function is one-to-one, -one, if I look at the entropy of x given f of x, that's zero because x is determined by f of x, since f is one-to-one. Okay. On the other hand, the function is hard to invert. So given f of x, it's hard to produce x. You can't do it except with negligible probability. This is just notation meaning vanishing faster than any polynomial in n. Okay. So intuitively, this unpredictability of x from f of x should correspond to some kind of entropy in a computational sense. right? So x is determined from f of x, so information theoretically no entropy, but it's hard to predict x from f of x, so in some computational sense there is entropy. So let's try and see what the right information theoretic analog of, of this unpredictability is. All right, so consider, suppose we had two jointly distributed random variables, x and y, and we had the prop uh, property that for every function a, the probability it can predict x from y all right, from a of y equals x, is at most p. Okay, and here, I'm, when I'm moving to the information theoretic context, I'm not putting any time constraint on, any computational constraint on the function a. I'm considering all functions. All right, so this does turn out um, to correspond to a very natural entropy notion. It was given a name by, by Dotis uh, et al., Dotis, uh, Ostrovsky, and Smith. They called, uh, they defined a notion called average min entropy, which happens to be equivalent. It can be written in a way that looks more like entropy, just changing where, uh, where uh, like min entropy, where you're just putting expectations and minimums and logs in the right place. You get a notion that's equivalent uh, to this, and this corresponds to having average min entropy log one over p in their definition. X has average min entropy log one over p given y, at least. And this turns out to be a, like min entropy stronger than Shannon entropy, this turns out to be stronger than conditional Shannon entropy. This implies that the Shannon entropy of x given y is at least log one over p. <coughs> okay, so now we wanna try and draw the analogy taking y to be f of x, the output of the, of the generator. So, it turns out in, there was a, one, one can think of this condition as some computational form of entropy and it was given a name by Shao et al. Uh, called un, unpredictability entropy. And just by analogy with, the, with what's on the right hand side, I take the logarithm of, logarithm of this prediction probability. Right? And so the log of that is, is something growing faster than any function growing faster than log n. All right, so x has some, this unpredictability entropy given f of x. And now the question is, all right, by analogy with this last implica implication, we would like to conclude that x has pseudo-entropy and in, is indistinguishable from something of, of entropy super logarithmic in n given f of x. Okay. So that's the, the question. Um, it would be great if the answer were, were yes to that. Unfortunately, what? Yeah. Oh, n, n, 
What is n? n? N is the input length we're looking at. Yeah. And when I say poly time, it's all polynomial in n. Yeah, please stop me with any, if anything's unclear. Okay, unfortunately, this turns out to be just false. All right, this is this. Let's, let's not read the, 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 the text there. Um, just at a more intu in, intuitive level, once I'm given f of x, okay, I can easily tell x apart from anything with any kind of randomness in it. Because, uh, because f is an efficiently computable function. So if you give me something and say, and I'm trying to tell whether it's x or something else, all I do is apply f to it and see if it equals the value f of x that I'm given. Okay, so given f of x, x is dis very distinguishable from everything of non-zero non entropy. Okay, so this is showing that uh, something that's very interesting about computational notions of entropy are relationships that hold in the information theoretic setting where you don't have computational resources can sometimes go disappear and don't hold anymore in the, when you think of computationally bounded analogs of them. Okay, and so this is one implication that held in information theoretic setting but doesn't hold in the computational setting. Okay, so our challenges are, okay, so x didn't have pseudo-entropy given f of x, but maybe we have some other way we can, conv can convert this unpredictability, maybe by doing some extra work into pseudo-entropy. And a second thing is um, what to do when the function is not one-to-one. -one. Okay, so here I talked about the unpredictability of x given f of x, and when f is not one-to-one, -one, this can really be trivial. It can be hard to predict x from f of x just because um, there are lots of strings that mapped to f of x. And I can't predict the one that you actually use just because they're from, for, for information theoretic reasons. Given f of x, it could be any of them with equal probability. Okay, so we need to reason um, in some, some better way. We can't just talk about unpredictability in this sense when we want to handle functions that aren't one-to-one. -one. Okay, so how, how, do we, how do we deal with this? So how did Hostad et al. deal with this? Um, they uh, used some kind, they, show, they showed by some kind of hashing, I can, you can turn this unpredictability into a, a, a gap uh, between pseudo-entropy and, and Shannon entropy. Um, the details aren't, aren't important, but basically they choose a certain kind of hash function and uh, a random number j from 1 to n and hash the given, they take f of x and a hash of some random number of bits of x. Okay, hash out some random number of bits of x. And intuitively, what this hashing um, accomplishes is first, it deals with the problem that f may be, not be one to one by um, the different pre-images of f of x will hash to different places, okay? And then uh, you, you um, uh, uh, get some additional pseudo-entropy from the remaining unpredictability, the hardness of inversion, inverting f. Okay, so let's not worry about it. They show this random variable that obtained by f and some hashing has pseudo-entropy larger than its Shannon entropy by a small amount, all right? A little bit more than one over n, a little bit more than log n over n. Okay, and not any old hash function works here. You need it for experts. You, you, you need the hash function to support to basically be hardcore functions in the Goldreich Levin sense. But that's not, if you don't know that terminology, don't, you, it's not needed for the rest of the talk. Okay, so the new result um, uh, coming from works with Heitner and Rheingold, and, and as stated here is this work with, new work with uh, uh, Colin, says, actually, we're not gonna do any hashing at all. We'll just look at f of x together with the bits of x. Okay. And um, this has what we call next bit pseudo-entropy, which I will define on the next slide. N, all right, so notice that the, the Shannon entropy of this is exactly N, because we have X, which has N bits of entropy, and F of X, because X is a uniformly random N bit string, all right, so it's same as, same as up here, 
and f is a function of that. It has n plus um, something super logarithmic in n. Okay, just like what we were hoping for and expecting from, from uh, the unpredictability. Okay, and nice, the, the usefulness of this as compared to the hostile result, first, there's no hashing involved. It really directly in the one-way function, looking at it the right way, we're getting some form of pseudo-entropy. And the other thing that's, that's useful is uh, that we're, in the Hostel et al. construction, you compare the pseudo-entropy to the Shannon entropy, but you don't actually know how much Shannon entropy, and it may be hard to compute how much Shannon entropy is in this random variable W. Okay, they don't give you any guarantee of, that, you, that you can compute that quantity, and that that's leads to many of the technical difficulties in their, in their work. Here, we're saying exactly how much uh, pseudo-entropy we can expect, because we know exactly how much Shannon entropy there is here. And finally, the gap is, is bigger. It's, it's really what we were hoping for, log n instead of log n over n. Okay, so, all right, so what is this notion of next bit pseudoentropy? So note, this is exactly the same, uh, in the example I gave before with f of x and x. Um, this does not have more than n bits of pseudoentropy in the, in the original sense. Okay, for the same reason that I said before, that um, if I'm given a pair, I can tell whether it's of the form f of x, x by just applying the function f. All right, so what is, how do, what's the, so, so what we're doing is relaxing the notion of pseudoentropy, and the notion that we get is this notion of pseudo, next bit pseudoentropy, where what I do is I imagine I'm giving, uh, giving someone an algorithm the elements of this tuple one at a time. So you give it f of x, and now we ask how much entropy does it look like x1 has given f of x? Right. Now I consider the next prefix, f of x and x1, how much entropy does x2 look like it has, and so on. Okay, so always looking at the entropy, how much pseudo-entropy the next bit has given the prefix. Okay, formally we want there to be random variables y1 through yn on the same probability space um, so that for every i, yi is indistinguishable from xi, even given f of x, uh, x1 up to xi minus 1. And if I sum up the entropies, the conditional entropies of the y's, along with the entropy of the first component, I get this n plus something super logarithmic in n. So if y1, if y1 was uh, a truly random bit, mm -hmm. that means that x1 is a hardcore bit of that That's right. Well, but it could be for information theoretic reasons. So in the case that f is not one to one. Yeah, but in the case it is one to one. In the case, yes, that's exactly what it means. So it's a generalization of the hardcore bit concept. It is. And also a generalization of the, sort of the uh, blum macaulay notion of next bit pseudo-randomness. Okay, so, um, all right. But what, what happens here that's different from that, that, the case that Dan, Dan was mentioning. So one can think of the extreme case of this where you ask that the bits one at a time are indistinguishable from random bits. Okay, uniformly random bits, not just indistinguishable from having a significant amount of entropy. In this case, it does turn out to be equivalent to pseudo-randomness, be the entire thing being indistinguishable from truly random. And what we're gaining from here is that when we talk about pseudo-entropy, the two notions are different from each other. And here, we, and this is this is an example. In the bottom line, that is true entropy. This is true entropy, is and is a and right and being indistinguishable. So xi is indistinguishable from this thing that has true entropy given the prefix. Right. So the yi's are allowed to be correlated with that? Yes, they probably have to be. Um, except in the extreme case. Uh, it, certainly for the result, they have to be correlated. Are they sampleable? Or uh, um, that's a more technical question. All right, short answer is no. Um, but. They're not too far from sampleable and some, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can yeah, talk about it afterwards. All right, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so what, is, uh, what are some consequences of this? Um, so <clears throat> this, uh, this result is simpler, this next bit, this way of getting next bit to entropy has led to a uh, significantly simpler and more efficient construction of pseudorandom generators from one-way functions. Uh, and also, 
and, and this translates to some quantitative improvement. So in the original result of Hostad et al., if you have a one-way function on n-bit inputs, it'll give you a pseudorandom generator uh, that requires a seed of something like n to the eighth. Okay, so while it's really important theoretical result for understanding what's possible in principle, um, not uh, uh, too complicated and inefficient uh, to be uh, uh, to have any hope of uh, being used in, in practice. Um, now we can bring with this this simpler construction the seed length uh, down to n cubed, which still is not efficient enough for practice, but um, at least is bringing things into the realm of reasonability and um, you know only two more ends to go till uh, <laughs> um, yeah okay so the output length will be uh, proportional to um, the number of times you've invoked the one-way function times log n or something. So it'll be a, um, the it won't be a large multiple of this, but there'll be a large additive. Stretch. I don't want to get too much into the in, in, into that. Yeah. I just had a question about the, so if the yi's are sampleable, would it reduce down to like a hardcore bit kind of thing? Because you can get two random the place and the two randomness. Um, I don't. I think there'll still be this gap. Um, yeah. Okay. So should we check? Is there a clock in this room? Check. We're doing the time. Five thirteen. Five Okay. Great. Okay. So maybe I'll just say the the key. Um, uh, uh, lemma or theorem that that goes into the, the result I just mentioned. And uh, as a, the examples from before suggest, what we need is some new way of relating pseudo-entropy and some kind of unpredictability. Okay? And it turns out we can give really a, a tight characterization. And this is in the work with Colin. Um, all right, so I have two jointly distributed random variables, y, Think of that as n bits, and z should be short. It could be one bit or a logarithmic number of bits, but it shouldn't be a lot of bits. All right, and we're interested in comparing the, the entropy of z given y to its predict, the predictability of z from y. Okay? And the result says that the z has um, delta bits more of pseudo-entropy given y than its real entropy. All right, so the gap between its pseudo-entropy and its Shannon entropy is, del is at least delta. If and only if no efficient algorithm, all right, this is just parsing the notation here, no efficient algorithm A can predict z from y um, at uh, distance at most delta, and distance is, is measured in KL divergence. Okay, so think of it, algorithm A is trying to predict Z from Y, and we're measuring its error by some kind of distance between the distribution YZ and YA of Z. All right, and the particular one is, is KL divergence, but just imagine some reasonable notion of measuring similarity between distri distributions. Okay, so, and, and really maybe the simplest case to think of in intuition is where, where z is determined from y. So z is a function of y, so we're saying pseudo-entropy at least delta is hard to predict with divergence at most delta. This is a theorem for pseudo-entropy or for Hill pseudo-entropy or for the next bit? This is for Hill pseudo-entropy, conditional pseudo-entropy. All right, so I'm asking why z should be indistinguishable from some y z prime where z prime has a lot of entropy given z. This is a theorem, yeah, for Hill, Hill pseudo-entropy. Um, and it's a, so it's an exact uh, characterization. So one note is that when this, this thing makes a lot of sense even when f, when z is not determined from, from y, which is a case that we're interested in when the function, one-way function is not one-to-one. -one. In that case, we look at the gap with the, the actual entropy. And here, the task of A is not just to predict z from y, but try and sample the right distribution of z given y. 
And we're measuring how well it does that, again, in, in KL divergence. Okay? Given this equivalence, ah, all right, and so you might wonder, how do we get around, how does this get around the bad example I said before, that unpredictability doesn't imply pseudo-entropy in the Hill sense? And it turns out this is coming from the restriction that Z is short, is from a small alphabet, doesn't have a lot of information in it. So in that previous example, Y was F of X and Z was the, the pre-image, was X, the, the bad example. Here we're requiring Z to be short, and that's what makes the, somehow the, the bad example go away. It's exactly delta in both cases, not like delta over 2 and 1. Exactly delta in, in both cases. Well, this definition we made. Uh, so we, we made the second definition. We came up with a notion of unpredictability that, would, that we could relate to pseudo-entropy in, in an exact way. So, um, Okay, there are some plus or minus, I should say, the deltas are the same, but there are some plus or minus negligible terms that are going to zero faster than 1 over any polynomial in N. Okay, but we think of delta, the delta that we're interested in is we're thinking of as a fixed constant or something much larger. Okay. In other words, it's less than or equal tilde. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Um, another remark uh, for maybe for experts is this can be viewed as an analog of the Impagliazzo hardcore theorem for Shannon entropy rather than min entropy. This may even be cryptic to, to the experts, but if anyone's interested in, in seeing w what this has to do with the hardcore theorem, maybe Colin's three lunch talk next week would uh, say something about that. Okay, so I'm going to skip how we use that to argue that. Um, this f of x, x1 to xn, has this notion of next bit pseudo-entropy. Um, but you know, hopefully from before, it was clear that what we wanted to do to prove something like that is somehow relate uh, un some kind of unpredictability and pseudo-entropy, which, th which the theorem does for us. And this fact that I mentioned about having to restrict to short z's, so looking at pseudo-entropy and unpredictability of short things, explains why we have to, the, sort of the move, the transition from pseudo-entropy to next-bit pseudo-entropy, where we look at individual bits. Can you give the intuition of the first step at all? What? How you go to KL divergence from just pure unpredictable? Um, so basically, if the divergence is, is O of log n, you can just, it's just an information theoretic fact that um, you, you must be finding an inverse with probability 2 to the minus that. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so what I talked about was this part of the picture, how by a new, finding the right form of computational entropy that's already present in a one-way function, we get a much simpler construction and understand better the construction of pseudorandom generators from one-way functions. What about the, ah, I was going to say, all right, and, and, all right, so doing that, now really follows the outline that I mentioned earlier of the, the Hastad et al. work. But I, I think I'll, uh, I don't want to say more about that. What I do want to say more about is this right side of the picture, where what about the other things here? And it turns out for the, the, the rest of this picture, which intuitively corresponds to security conditions in, in cryptography that don't have to do with secrecy, which is what the pseudonymous relates to, but have more to do with unforgeability, producing uh, generating things that you're not supposed to, finding collisions in hash functions or forging digital signatures and, and so on. And for this, we have to look for, identify, and find a different form of computational entropy present in a one-way function. And I'd like to just illustrate that notion. And this is actually, this, this came first, so as to say a little bit of kind of what happened here historically. So we had a construction a paper with Haitner, Noyen, Ong, and Rheingold uh, from a few years ago, which was closed one of the sort of 